Artificial Intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? It's kind of a complicated question, but I'm going to give it my best shot. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is like giving computers the ability to think and learn on their own. Kind of like letting a computer write its own code. So, instead of telling a computer exactly what to do and giving it step-by-step -step instructions, we instead give it some rules and let it figure out things by itself. My goal here is to explain exactly where we are with this technology, but also where we've been and where we're headed. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you look around, AI is already here. It's everywhere. Every time you get a recommendation on YouTube or make a search on Google, you're already using AI. We've all heard about ChatGPT these days, but did you know that it's the fastest growing consumer app ever? It's a shining example of the current state of artificial intelligence. I say that, but it's kind of hard to talk about quote-unquote AI because it's not just one thing. It's a collection of different technologies that vary in terms of strength. Today, we live in the era of weak AI, and I honestly think we're going to look back at this time as sort of the good old days, a period of renaissance with the technology. As we use our series and our Alexas, we're pointed in the direction of strong AI, or artificial general intelligence. This is when AI reaches the level of human intelligence. But we have a long way to go before we get to that point. So in the meantime, let's look at the roots of this technology. In some ways, it actually goes back to ancient times when there were legends of human-like mechanical beings with intelligence. But for all intents and purposes, AI as we know it today really begins in the 1950s. Of course, you have the Turing test at the start of the decade, which at this point is an outdated way of determining whether or not something is AI. The term itself, artificial intelligence, was coined in 1955 by John McCarthy at Dartmouth College. These were the really early years of AI, and things were generally optimistic. But... Over the decades, however, it became increasingly clear that simulating human brain power out of the digital ones and zeros a computer is based on? Kind of difficult. Things changed, though, in the late 20th century with the rise of machine learning. Thus began the era of weak or narrow AI, which is a technology that's very much assisted by humans. Everything you hear about AI these days really comes down to machine learning a world in which computer systems can learn from data and improve over time. A way to think about how the AI works is that memory game for children, where you have a set of cards and you try to guess matching pairs. When you start the game, you have zero knowledge of which cards are which. But over time, you start to recognize where the cards are, and by the end, you figured it out. In a nutshell, this is how machine learning works. Deep learning is the next level of this, and continuing the analogy, it would be like holding up a magnifying glass to the different cards and being able to distinguish them based on the tiny little paper fibers on the card itself. Deep learning is machine learning, it's just a subset of it, and it's really taken off in the last decade, characterized by neural networks of digital data. It basically consists of a digital brain that's constructed through layers and layers of connected parts. These different parts do math on the data they get, and the entire network learns as a result. What exactly is happening in these systems is a mystery to all humans. It's like there's a black box of calculations and processes at the heart of these systems. We basically train AI systems on a bunch of data, and... They create their own code to solve problems and recognize patterns. The data that's fed to these systems can be anything from text to numbers to sounds. The more data that's read, the better the AI. And in today's world of big data, it's a commodity that's easy to get. It's incredible what can come out of a deep learning network. For example, it can figure out what's in a picture, understand different languages, 
or guess what might happen next in a piece of text. And this brings me to generative AI, which is the newest form of deep learning, popularized by software like ChatGPT and Dolly 2. This form of AI is all about the text prompts. So really, these days all you need is a computer keyboard to harness some of the most powerful calculating machines that have ever existed. If a computer is a bicycle for your mind, generative AI is like a moped. One can easily generate unique music, code, images, stories, legal documents, and more. ChatGPT by OpenAI has become the flagship of this technology, and it can respond to a wide variety of text prompts with impressive, and sometimes not so impressive, results. Originally, it was trained on something like 300 billion words from sources like Wikipedia, random articles, books, and so on. It's pretty easy to use, too. When I'm trying to come up with a children's story for my children, it's looked at all the classic fairy tales, all the modern ones, and everything in between, and can give me something fresh and fun to ultimately put the kids to sleep. Within two months of its launch, ChatGPT had 100 million monthly active users, and it sort of sparked an AI arms race, with Google and Microsoft quickly responding with their own products. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. You have image generators like Midjourney that allow you to create pictures out of thin air from simple text prompts. Of course, in the case of Midjourney and many others, you have to pay for it. There are so many companies out there right now that are making tons of money based on this technology. It's like there's a gold rush of AI, but the real gold is if you're selling a shovel. Even ChatGPT only allows you to do so many prompts per hour before you have to pull out your wallet. But there's a great variety. For example, you have MyHeritage that allows you to animate still photos, or Topaz, which allows you to enhance image resolutions, something we used to laugh about. AI in these systems are basically regurgitating the data they are fed into new things, and it opens the door to new possibilities, but also to new problems. There's questions about the inherent bias of AI, because after all, it's just an extension of the human data that it's being trained on. But it goes well beyond this. There's questions about copyright, privacy, transparency, misinformation, job displacement, and more. A lot of these things we're just going to have to figure out over time, and the law is struggling to keep up. It reminds me of people worrying about Photoshop when it came out, or music piracy in the 90s. Each of these developments forever changed the world, but didn't end it. We adapted. There's no doubt about it that AI is going to change the way we do things from here on out, whether we like it or not. But you shouldn't think of it as this all-knowing thing that's going to take over the world. And you would know this if you've ever seen an image generator trying to make a hand. But just because it's not perfect doesn't mean it's not going to affect all sorts of different fields, which it will. From healthcare to customer service, driving, finance, software development, manufacturing, education, and the list goes on and on. There are certainly benefits of AI. Machine learning systems are really good at analyzing and giving insight on incredibly large amounts of data. So things like weather predictions and medical treatments are going to improve tenfold. Not to mention the creative possibilities, which are really exciting. This video alone is packed heavily with ChatGPT writing and mid-journey imaging. So, personally, I look at generative AI as just another tool in the toolbox, and I look forward to future developments. For example, I can't wait till you can easily create motion picture video out of AI. And that brings me to where we are right now, because everything I've talked about so far is digital at the core, meaning it's based on ones and zeros. It's important because some people have said that we're in the fourth phase of the Industrial Revolution, but I don't think we're there yet because we're still fundamentally using the same digital systems that we've been using since the third phase started. Something fundamental needs to change, like quantum computing, which is a revolution in hardware. And it's interesting to think about the hardware revolution of quantum computing combining forces with the software revolution of artificial intelligence and where that's going to take us. Hopefully it's going to be awesome and not the end of the world, but let's just keep in mind 
that we might be in the golden era right now and we should try to live it up. Have a good one.